Okay, so this is my grandpa on my mother's side, Hector Mackenzie, from um, Gearlock on the West Coast. I was wondering, Grandpa, if you could tell us um, a little bit, little bit about sort of um, growing up in Gearlock and uh, a wee bit of your background and obviously speaking uh, Gaelic and so on, please. Yes, well, I was born in 1926, in March uh, 1926, and uh, it was a, a time when, between the Great War and the uh, last war, the last World War, uh, that was uh, a very uh, difficult time politically because there was always this threat of uh, some stronger power in Europe coming in and uh, threatening the British Empire. Now, we were born, uh, my sister and I, that was the family, were born in Gearloch, in the parish of Gearloch, uh, and we were brought up in a, an area where Gaelic was spoken in the home sometimes, sometimes not. It would depend on the interest that people the individual people had in the language, but there was quite a lot of Gaelic spoken uh, from day to day, in and out of the house, uh, at work, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, there was a kind of, a, I suppose we could call it a snobbery of some kind, attaching to the a considered more modern language, English, because uh, if you knew English very well, uh, you can understand this perfectly well, uh, folks would have a, a more interest in you as a, an employee, because uh, Eng English was the language of, of the country in many ways, and uh, if you were wanting to get on, as they would say, then it was English for you, as it were. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand, there were those of us who valued very highly the uh, traditions that we had, and uh, we certainly valued the language that we had. And while uh, it wasn't widespread, it was sufficiently spoken for, for it to survive, for a good many years, and it still has survived. So that was the beginning of things, okay. yes. And um, you're saying there was slight uh, snobbery. What, could, you, can you remember any times where you felt like maybe you shouldn't be speaking Gaelic, or uh, was there any times that you can remember that stand out for you? Where you thought, Not really, but we had lots of stories from uh, my parents, from my previous generation, about uh, teachers, particularly Scottish Education Department, seek, trying to uh, dim down any light there was on Gaelic. In, uh, in other words, uh, you, you heard little about the wealth of uh, literature and of uh, folklore and whatnot that was contained in the language. You heard very little of that and you heard a, quite a strong emphasis, which I can understand in a sense, mm -hmm. on English and uh, learning English and so on. So but there, was, there wasn't a great enmity or anything like that. It was just the two things uh, went together, you know, from day to day. Mm -hmm. And so when did you, so did you start, so obviously you, when you were born, you were sort of brought up speaking Gaelic. When did you, when was the crossover when, you started learning English. Was this, at, was this in primary school? Or? Oh, primary school, yes, it was. Right. But we didn't uh, necessarily speak uh, Gaelic in the, in the home like that. It was just, they were interchangeable, pretty, pretty much. The two languages were interchangeable, and it was quite a, quite a rich way of um, beginning to speak, if you like. Mm -hmm. okay. It's two languages, yeah. And how would you see it now? Um, from going back then and now, would you, would you say there's, how, how, would, how would you compare the two now? From well, 
know there is a stronger lobby, if you like, for Garnick, for, you know, pushing it and teaching it and so on. Uh, whether it uh, is effective or not, I wouldn't know, but certainly there is more going for Garnick, as it were, than there was in my time. Uh, there's more broadcasting, there's more uh, educational work in schools, and there is lobbying to get uh, schools to have a Gaelic department and all that kind of thing. There's certainly that, but as far as the advancement of the language is concerned, I wouldn't be sure at all. Okay. And nowadays, would you, do you often, I mean, do you often speak Gaelic now to, well, where would you, if you, what would the example be, would you use it now? Is it quite sort of rare now? Or? It's well, fairly rare. It would be spoken amongst a generation of my own age or a bit, maybe quite a bit younger than that, and by those who purposefully want to, uh, to increase and to spread. But uh, apart from that, it's, it's uh, on the way in, it's on the way down, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how, how, on a personal level, how do you feel personally about that? Like, you know, well, like less people are speaking Gaelic now. How do you feel? I feel quite strongly in a sense that uh, we've lost... Uh, window, if you like, on life and on culture and on a way of living. We, we've lost a, a window on that kind of thing, which is a pity, you know, it's a pity that the, 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 more, the more variety of uh, approaches you can have to, to culture, I think, the better. Okay, I wonder, um, Grandpa, could you tell us maybe, um, you take us back in time to the last century, um, maybe the late 20s and 30s, and any sort of stories you can recall on to... Yes, to well, uh, 1926 I was born, and uh, the early part of that uh, era was the time when, for example, uh, there were already rumblings of threatened war on the continent. But in addition to that, there was a, an attack on Abyssinia by Mussolini, the a, Italian dictator, uh, who actually used a, poison gas on these Abyssinians. And uh, there was the evacuation about that, roughly about that time, of, that's what I recall, of the residents of St Kilda, an island out in the Far Hebrides. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the sheep, the, the St Kilda sheep, coming to the market in Dingwall. Well, I, I assume that's where they came from, but... Crofters in Gerloch suddenly producing a sort of dark coloured uh, sheep, uh, and we were told at the time that these sheep had come from uh, St Kilda and uh, mm -hmm. they were sc scattered amongst the local flocks and so on, a few of them. Uh, it was also that a time when, as I said, rumblings of war were getting louder and louder uh, for those who had ears to hear it uh, on the continent and, uh, and at home here in Britain. And uh, very soon, of course, by the end of the 30s, by the end of that uh, second uh, 
rather third decade of the century war broke out as we know and uh, that was a terrific change in the way of life of a lot of us in the Highland area because we were suddenly issued with uh, gas masks and uh, the Home Guard was instituted and uh, it was a time when food scarcities began to loom large on the horizon and people began to uh, pickle eggs to preserve them so that they could last through the winter mm. and uh, people began to think in terms of supplies of food from perhaps local uh, sources like venison or uh, fish of various kinds and uh, these things were bringing a quite a definite change in the way that people lived from day to day and the, the way people spoke really to one another because there were new there were new things uh, coming into being each day there was the appearance of a kind of a identity card that everybody had to have and here and there along the routes to uh, other parts of Rothshire you had guards uh, asking to see those asking if they could see those identification cards to make sure that there were no uh, intruders and spies at large and I'm sure there must have been quite a few of them on the go because there were stories of a broadcast by a character called Lord Ha Ha who uh, was a German uh, a defector to the to the German uh, side and who did his best to uh, denigrate and to run down anything to do with Britain and her, her armies and her navy and services generally. Okay. And By the way, I can recall a, at that early period of my life, maybe the odd visit to Inverness, we would get a car, taxis weren't so, so expensive as they are today, uh, you could, could possibly get a car and t take it out for the day to, to Inverness. And I can remember one occasion in particular in the a beginning of the of the war it was a coming into Inverness with others and coming a, coming out at the station going into the station and uh, to my utter amazement there were two amongst lots of other travelers there were two figures that stood out at the head of the group and one very tall a, a vigorous man and another a, looking like an, an invalid really and they were none other than a, King George the Sixth, who was a very sick man at that time and Lord Lovett who was a, in charge of the um, men who were training for the command of service at Achnacari and these two are, I, 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 that memory imprinted clearly on my mind these two people coming off the, the train very shortly before a uh, King uh, Edward the uh, sorry King George the sixth uh, died of his the trouble that he had 
Now, other trips to Inverness just involved uh, perhaps a visit to somebody in hospital or a, maybe a visit to the hospital itself for some reason or other. But there were few and far between. But uh, my memory of Inverness at that time was a smallish town, very attractive, uh, the riverside particularly attractive. And also I have memories of very fine high teas before you went home in uh, some of the restaurants in Inverness. They were quite memorable really and uh, that's about all I can recall uh -huh. of Inverness except the fact that there was very often a piper or a musician, a person playing the melodeon or something like that down at one of the bridges which made a quite a, an impression on my mind at the time. Okay. And, uh, okay.